Hello and welcome back. In today's very short video, I'm going to show you that all you need to run the Core i7-13700K Raptor Lake CPU to its limits is two water-cooled CPU VRM phases. On screen, you can see the Z690 Torpedo EKX motherboard with all but two CPU vCore phases disabled. We're running Prime95 on a Core i7-13700K with all P cores and E cores enabled and the Turbo Boost 2.0 power limits unlocked. So in this video, I'll explain you how I set up the test and why it works the way it does. All right, let's get started. Honestly, this video is long overdue. I've been wanting to get around testing this specific part of the Z690 Torpedo EKX since I launched the Scatterbencher guide with the 13700K last November. I used the Z690 Torpedo EKX motherboard in that guide, which features an EK light block. If you missed that guide, a light block is like a monoblock because it cools both the CPU and the VRM. However, unlike the traditional monoblocks, the VRM isn't actively cooled by the liquid. Instead, the water block connects to the stock thermal solution with a thermal pad. That connection ensures sufficient heat exchange to vastly improve the VRM temperatures. As I showed in Scatterbencher number 34 with the 12900KF and Scatterbencher number 50 with the 13700K, the theoretical and practical VRM thermal performance improvement over a standard passive heatsink was clear from the internal test data and the data from my overclocking guides. While the light block doesn't perform as well as a typical monoblock, the thermal improvement is still significant. One topic that I didn't cover in that video is that the improved thermal performance can also open the door for maybe some VRM cost optimizations. VRM is short for Voltage Regulator Module. It typically includes several power MOSFETs and a dedicated controller. The VRM ensures the right power is provided from the power supply to the CPU or GPU. The power delivery design of motherboards and graphics cards is vital for stability, reliability, performance, efficiency and safety reasons. Engineers must carefully consider several elements during the motherboard or graphics card power design phase. Those elements include power requirements, thermal management, electrical component selection, protection features, PCB layout and EMI mitigation. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, a VRM design needs to be cost effective too. And that's because the VRM components are usually the largest chunk of a motherboard's bill of materials, aside from the chipset, of course. So any dollar spent too much on the VRM can mean being less competitive in the market. The CPU VRM design of the Z690 Torpedo EKX consists of the following major components. An MPS monolithic power system, MP2960 digital multiphase controller driving both the VCC core and VCC GT voltages, and 16 MPS monolithic power system, MP879927 amps IntelliFace DRMOS. DRMOS driver MOS, not doctor MOS, is a power delivery solution that integrates the MOSFET driver directly on chip with the power FETs. Funny tidbit, Intel wrote the DRMOS 1.0 specification all the way back in 2004. Each CPU power phase consists of two DRMOS components. The MP87992 is rated to operate continuously up to 70 amps and 125 degrees Celsius. The configuration for this motherboard has over current protection set at 52 amps per phase, so 416 amps in total when all eight phases are enabled. If we'd use a CPU voltage of 1.2 volt, that would translate into about 500 watt of output power. Anyway, back to the main topic of this video. I wanted to check how much the EK light block could impact the VRM temperatures when we push the VRM to its limit. To test this, I use the following hardware. A quick note on the thermal solution. As per usual, I use the EFCSB to map the radiator fan curve to the water temperature. Without going into too many details, I've attached an external temperature sensor from the water in the loop to the EFCSB. Then I use the low-high setting to map the fan curve from 25 to 40 degrees Celsius. 
The main takeaway from this configuration is that it gives us a good indicator of whether or not the cooling solution is saturated. To test the VRM capability, I run Prime95 small FFTs without AVX on the Core i7-13700K with unlocked Turbo Boost 2.0 power limits. All P cores and E cores are enabled and run at 5.3 and 4.2 GHz respectively. The average CPU package power throughout the test is about 260 Watt. I changed the number of active phases in the motherboard BIOS by using a test BIOS provided by MSI. I also hooked up the Elmo Labs EVC2 device to the motherboard. This allows me to talk to the MP2960 CPU VCC core voltage regulator. That was necessary for two reasons. One, to set the number of active phases to three and two. While the setting is available in the BIOS, the board didn't always boot up for some reason. So alternatively, I could adjust it at runtime in the operating system using the EVC2 software. Two, to increase the OCP level at runtime. The default configuration sets the OCP at 52 amps multiplied by the number of active phases. The Prime95 workload uses about 180 amps. So when we're down to three phases, it will exceed the configured OCP of 156 amps. Fortunately, we can adjust the OCP level to 127 amps per phase. Then I measure the CPU input power using the Elmo Labs PMD and a bunch of other metrics like temperatures using hardware info. I specifically want to answer three questions. One, how many phases can I disable before the system gets unstable? Two, what is the VRM temperature? And three, what is the power efficiency? Meaning what's the input power versus the CPU package power? Let's have a look at the results. From this chart, we can derive the answers to all of our questions. First, I can reduce the number of CPU phases from eight to two, and the system remains stable. Second, when we change the phase count from eight to two, the VRM temperature doubles from 50 to 100 degrees Celsius. While that may seem exceptionally high, remember that the VRM components are rated to operate safely well above 100 degrees Celsius. So thermally, this configuration is perfectly acceptable. Third, the power efficiency drops from about 85% to 77%. While that may sound like a lot, at a CPU package power of 300 watt, that's a difference of 37 watt input power to the power supply. So it's not like it will drastically increase your power bill. Now, this wouldn't be a true scattermancher video if we didn't try to push our two-phase system to its limits. I still run Prime95, but I also enable AVX and then later AVX2 to significantly increase the current draw. In addition to that, I also change a couple more settings. Increase the CPU TJ max to 115 degrees Celsius, maxed out the per phase OCP to 127 amps, and maxed out the allowed VRM temperature to 150 degrees Celsius. Here are the main differences in power consumption between the three two phase configurations. By enabling AVX2, the CPU package power increases about 28%. That translates into a 25% increase in per phase current draw and a 37% increase in total CPU power consumption. The power efficiency decreases from 77.1% to 72.4% and the VRM temperature now exceeds 110 degrees Celsius. If we consider the peak measurements, it becomes even crazier. The most we can squeeze out of this two phase system is 505 watt CPU input power for a 351 watt CPU package power and 121 amps per phase. Admittedly, this is not a sustainable configuration given both the CPU and the VRM are triggering the thermal protection mechanisms. Also, our EFC SB regulated thermal solution is entirely at its limits. So what would be a sustainable configuration then? Well, let's try the same AVX and AVX2 Prime95 test but with three phases enabled instead of two phases. The CPU package power is still 340 watt on average. However, the per phase current now only peaks at 81 amps and the maximum MOS temperature is 105 degrees Celsius. 
Deficiency is only 77.6%, down from our original 85% with 8 faces, but not too bad, considering we're relying on less than half the face count. Alright, let's wrap this up. First, I'd like to thank my friends at MSI and Elmo Labs for helping me set up this demonstration. I know how to use the EVC2 to talk to digital VRM controllers on a basic level, but for stuff like this, I always need a little bit of extra help to do it properly. Second, I'm genuinely impressed how well the EK Lightblock is coping with the VRM temperatures, despite its relatively basic design. I was honestly hoping that maybe we'd be able to run the 13700K with four faces instead of eight faces, so half the face count, but the fact that we were able to run it with only two faces enabled, no, that, blow my, that blew my mind. Uh, thirdly, I'm kind of interested to see how water-cooled VRMs can help us either cost-optimize some motherboard designs or maybe help squeeze more performance out of basic or even high-performance designs. I know there's a lot more that goes into designing a proper VRM than worrying about the thermal limitations. And I also know that you know having better cooling isn't a catch-all solution, but still, maybe something cool will come out of this. Lastly, I think that you know if you've been following my Scatterbencher guides for a while, the VRM temperature has become kind of a recurring theme when it comes to bottlenecks for our overclocks. We've seen this in the GT1030 and ARC8380 guides where the VRM temperature becomes the limiting factor, primarily for the voltage headroom. But we've also seen kind of similar situation on high-end motherboards with really high core CPUs, for example, the Threadripper series, where when we push the CPU to its limits, we also see that the VRM needs to be water-cooled to provide that amount of power to the CPUs. I'm sure that I'll, I'll see something similar when I later on try out that Sapphire Rapids 56 core uh, on a uh, on a high-end motherboard. Anyway, we'll see that in the in the future. That's not for the immediate release. Anyway, that's all for me today. I thank you for watching and my trade Patreons for the support. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to drop them in the comment section below. As per usual, I'll also put up a written guide uh, on my uh, blog or you know, a written version of this video on my blog if you want to read through the settings or check my results again. And that's it. See you next time.